Round 11 and 12 of the IndyCar season would both take place at the Iowa Speedway, the shortest circuit on the IndyCar calendar, meaning lots of laps and thus lots of opportunities to watch Stingray Rob stick it in the wall. Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1 and the Comedy Review, the series that gets released almost before the race is over. Actually, that's a bad one to use when I'm three days late, isn't it? Anyway, we have not one, but two races to cover this time round, so let's not waste any more time and roll that intro. Starting as usual with the news, and I can't lie, there really wasn't a lot going on into this week's doubleheader. Connor Daly was back again, still subbing in for Simon Pagano, though people seem to care even less than they did last time, and Delara rolled out a new wheel hub update to prevent a repeat of Carl Kirkwood's crash at the Indy 500 in May. Really bad weekend to announce that as it turned out. We'll get into Stingray's three-wheeled antics a little later. For now, we've got first practice to dissect, and straight away, the Andretti drivers were causing trouble. Roman Grosjean was clearly fed up of crashing all the time after Toronto, and so tried to balance the books by killing Herta early into the session. Devlin DiFrancesco was also causing problems, driving so slowly he nearly caused a bigger accident behind with Ryan hunter Ray and Marcus Ericsson. Then it turned out this was just Devlin driving at full racing speed. We'll give the Andrettis a break as Augustine Canapino just caught my attention. And as a Brit, I would be doing my country a disservice if I didn't rip into the Argentinians for a bit. Canapino has been rather quiet of late, though got some TV time when he spun exiting the pit lane of all things. Despite this, the AMR safety team still thought he was safe enough to restart and unleash back onto the racetrack. Practice ended with Grosjean again, as the DHL Honda nearly used championship leader Alex Palloa a takeoff strip before sending Ferrucci high towards the wall. Though, given this was Santino, he probably deserved it. It was Oval Master Joseph Newgarden on top heading into qualifying, with Penske looking quick across the board. With this being a double header, quality would work a little differently to normal. With drivers setting two consecutive laps, their average speed on the first setting the grid for race one and the second for race two. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, the weather clearly had other ideas, and with IndyCar drivers afraid of getting a little bit wet, we were stuck in a long delay before we could set the grid for Saturday and Sunday. Eventually, we were able to get going, with friend of the channel, David Malukas, the first to make an impression. So-called Little Dave may need to change his name to Big Dave now, in reference to how big his balls had to be to keep his foot down as the car stepped out on the opening lap. That first tour was so good, he broke the IndyCar scoreboard, but for race two, it was good enough to provisionally go to the top. You see, I can be nice to these guys. All it takes is a Twitter follow, apparently. Stingray, that's all you have to do. Malukas' times would remain in the top half of the table, though were eventually trumped by the Andrettis and Penske's. Then Will Power had a go, and clearly he'd seen the new Oppenheimer film as he proceeded to nuke the opposition. Power would thus take pole for both races at Iowa, but would he be able to convert either into a win? Well, let's find out. Race 1 went green, despite the field being about as organised as the government over here in the UK at the moment. Regardless, Power held the lead from Penske teammate Scott McLaughlin. Further back, Hunter Ray finally remembered what sport he was coming back to as he went four wide on the opening lap the exchange somehow not resulting in a plane crash. But as the Penske drivers soared away in an early 1-2-3, the initial battles were between the Ganassi of Dixon and the McLaren of Pato Ward. While they were scrapping, the leaders were already finding the chumps competing for participation awards at the rear. Basically, this race was turning into the real-life equivalent of Baby Park. Despite weaving through the slow traffic, the top three were being fairly well-behaved at this stage. That would all change after the first round of stops, however. Joseph Newgarden deciding he didn't like being third anymore and challenging for the lead. There was a close call as McLaughlin mistook the number two car for Roman Grosjean and thus tried to ram him off the track, though by the time IndyCar had shown a replay of the pass, Newgarden was lining up an overtake on his other teammate, Will Power, for P1. Power held him off initially, but on lap 121, Joseph made it by. And from there, the battle for the lead was pretty much done. It was quite an unusual IndyCar race, made even more strange by the fact that by half distance, we hadn't seen a single caution period. When the yellows did fly, however, there was no surprise in guessing who it was. Graham Rahal saying hi to the fans in the grandstand as his race came to an end. We get going again on lap 166, as Power Stay got worse, being swamped at the restart. Pato Award also attempted a move for second, though eventually backed out of the pass on McLaughlin. 
Hey, at least he's learned from Indy. We'll take a quick break from the leaders to check in on Dumb and Dumber, or should I say Di Francesco and Peterson. The pair clashed in the pit lane where Peterson's pit crew were exposed as legally blind. On the bright side, I don't think it's possible for the paddock to hate the man anymore after mid-Ohio. There were no such worries for Joseph Newgarden, however. Hitachi Chevy cruised to a victory that once he had the lead, never really looked in doubt. Now, you'd assume Joseph would be pretty happy with that result, though you'd be wrong. In fact, he was rather pissed off about it. The source of the Americans' frustrations had been with the lap cars he'd had to overtake on his way to the win. Newgarden was so incensed, he threatened to, quote, fence them if they did it again. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think you can sell them, Joseph. That joke was not only bad, most people probably didn't get it either. On the bright side, thank God for New God and sake, the IndyCar field is 100% white. Moving on, and Sunday would bring about race two, with a special guest in the form of Ed Sheeran to start the race. He had been told he had to copy the starter from the day before, so something Sheeran's quite good at already. Power made another decent start ahead of McLaughlin and Malukas. Meanwhile, Patuo Ward was getting his act together early, running side by side with Newgarden, before the pair formed a temporary truce to soar by Ed Carpenter. Newgarden then left O Ward in the dust to chase after his teammates, who, like race one, were battling for the lead. Joseph turned down the afterburners and made a double overtake for P1 I can't write a joke about because it was just too f***ing awesome. Now he only had one caution in race one, though Augustine Canapino was quick to equal that tally when he slammed his Junko's car into the wall on lap 88. They say cautions breed cautions, but in this instance it was Stingray Rob breeding tyres. As I said at the start, what a weekend for Delara to unveil their new hub design, eh? Admittedly, this wasn't their fault. Just whoever it was at Delcoin Racing who thought Stingray would be any quicker as a tricycle out there. We can add them to the idiot bin next to the one who hired Stingray in the first place. <laughs> Sorry, no, that was too harsh. Either way for IndyCar, this was no laughing matter. They disqualified the 51, and can I just say, thank God no one was hit by that wheel and turned this race into a Rocket League tournament. With Stingray out and thus the field feeling much safer, we went green on lap 168. With lap runners in the way, New Garden was free to control the restart. His cars went four wide further back, and we were treated to some fantastic racing. Joseph looked set to make it two for two then except Felix Rosenquist and McLaren didn't seem to get that memo and out of nowhere started to put the pressure on. And just as Newgarden looked like he'd got the situation under control, the yellows were out again, this time for Ryan hunter Ray, who decided he just couldn't be bothered with the last 10 laps of the race. We went green with just four tours left to go and immediately Rosenquist went from hero to zero as he got wide and let the whole field past him. That left Will Power and Alex Pillow as the only two who could challenge Newgarden out front, Though, after another 250 laps of the Iowa circuit, Joseph hung on and made it a clean sweep of the weekend. Overall then, a pretty fun few days of racing, where we had less of drivers slamming themselves into the barriers and more of the good, close, wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing we expect from IndyCar. And then Stingray Rob, of course, though at least he gave me some material to work with this weekend. If you enjoyed this doubleheader comedy review though, make sure you get subscribed to the channel for more in the future. Next up, it's the third running of the Music City Grand Prix. And if you know my history, then you'll know I'm already hyped for that one. A final thank you, as always, goes to my patrons and channel members. And if you'd like to help support me in the channel, then you can find all about that using the links in the description below. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see you soon with another video. But until then, have a good one.